Here we are, another episode of Let There Be Talk. It is number 474 today on the April 29th, and I'm not going to lie to you, I have tried to do this intro six times. Six times. Sometimes it just doesn't happen. You get up, you're like, all right, I got to get the podcast up. Your brain's not working. I got to do the intro and just try to sit down and just talk to thin air. And it just fucking crumbles and you start to go crazy like, God damn it. That's all part of the gig, though. That is all part of the gig. Special day today. It is April 29th, and this is the anniversary of Van Halen's Fair Warning, which I will talk way in depth about on the Patreon bonus episode coming out tomorrow. But the reason I bring that up is my guest today is arguably... What do they say that for? Arguably? Is somebody going to argue with me about this? Yeah, I say I'll argue with that. Uh, uh, arguably. I can't even fucking talk today. Anyway, my guest is legendary rock and roll photographer, Neil Zlozauer. And it took me years to even figure out how to say his name as a kid as I saw hundreds and hundreds of his incredible photos hanging up in my bedroom, cut out of circus, Hit Parader, Cream, Rip, all of that. And just stared at his photos and his album covers, like the back shots on Van Halen 2. This man is an absolute master. He's been shooting photos for 49 years. And in my eyes, he has made it 100%. He's been doing art for 49 years. These days, he just kind of tinkers around in his warehouse in Hollywood, working on vintage motorcycles, and I look at him and go, wow, that is, that is a cool back end of your life. He's 64 years old. He's just wrenching on bikes and, and cars. Looks pretty cool to me. Looks pretty pleasant. And it was an honor to have him on the podcast, another great, great rock and roll photographer. I think these guys are a lot like drummers. They are the unsung heroes of rock and roll. And thank God he was out there doing what he does because uh, we get to see and remember it. Some of you weren't there, so you can look at it the first time and be like, did that shit really happen? It really did. I saw Van Halen many, many, many times, multiple nights every time they came to town. And I look at his photos, not of just Van Halen, by the way, this man has shot everyone. I'll give you a little rundown. You can go to his website, zloz.com, and just lose your mind. ACDC, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, Black Sabbath, David Bowie, Dio, Devo, Elvis Costello, Frank Zappa, Guns N' Roses. The portfolio of Guns N' Roses is just crazy famous, along with the Motley Crue Blood Sessions. The Zeppelin stuff makes my head fall off. Lemmy, Kiss, Early Kiss, Pantera, Patti Smith, Prince. His Randy Rhodes photo, you're going to recognize it right away. It's that one where Randy's on the couch kind of tuning up, getting ready for a gig somewhere or maybe in the recording studio. Not sure where that was. But all his photos are spectacular, and thank God we have them. Thank God we have these photos. And, uh, you know, one day I'll just have all this stuff hanging in the house somewhere and I won't even need to leave. I'll just look around and be like, you know what I'm saying? Just talk to my photos like a crazy man with a French bulldog and a, a Topo Chico and some incense burning just going into Cuckooville. <laughs> anyway. What a great guest today. Before I do get into it, I just want to tell you guys, I am in Las Vegas right now for the next seven days. Come catch me at the Comedy Cellar at the Rio Hotel. And if you go to the ComedyCellar.com and click on the Vegas link, you can use the checkout code CC Strip. That's the letter C, letter C, S-T-R-I-P, CC Strip at checkout and save half the money on the ticket. If you're not in the Vegas area, I will be in uh, La Jolla at the Comedy Store June 7th through the 9th. Get tickets for that. I'm headlining that. 
and working on all kinds of great new stuff. I did mention the Patreon, and I want to give a big love to all the Patreoners. Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey is where you can hear the bonus episodes. There's 31 of them up right now. Brand new Patreoners, Art Grigo. How are you, buddy? Thank you so much. Keith Malcolm and Matthew James. Some brand new Patreoners. Then we got my man Robert Searles, who upped his pledge. And believe me, all this helps. It keeps the, uh, keeps the motor moving here on Let There Be Talk. Uh, I guess that is about it. I want to give uh, a big shout out to uh, my man, Brody Stevens, thinking about you today, dude. I miss you. My love for you, brother. Okay, let's get into it. Neil Zlozauer, here he is. Episode number 474, The Candles Are Lit. Thank you, guys. Oh, yeah, here we are. Another episode of Let There Be Talk. Got a, uh, a legend on today, man, in my eyes. Introduce yourself. My name is Neil Zlozauer, rock photographer. Friends call me Zlo's. Been around for doing photos in the wonderful music industry for about the last 49 years. 49 years? Yep. November this year will make 50 years. So. I'm 53. How old are you? 64. 64? You look great, dude. Yeah, I'm pretty preserved. Yeah, 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 right? Like, look at Keith Richards, man. Yeah. I, did you grow up in L.A.? Lived here all my life, Fairfax High School. I actually live eight blocks from Fairfax High School right now. So, wow! Yeah. Did you grow up in uh, what neighborhood did you grow up in? In that around Cantor's, right there? Yeah, more like Third Street, Crescent Heights, Fairfax, close to where Sammy's Camera is right now. Oh yeah, I know where that is. Which is on Colgate and Drexel. I grew up on Colgate and Crescent Heights. That's amazing. So yeah. you're sixty three. Four. 64, you you caught all the great rock. Because I'm 53, so I come in right after Zeppelin. So 78's my first concert. But what got you into rock and roll and then eventually into photography? Well, I mean, I always liked, I remember watching the Beatles with my aunts and uncles and mother and father and grandmother and everything in 64. And that was an eye-opening event for anybody. And then... After that, I got into the Stones, and I bought my first album, High Titan Greengrass, which my friend Guy Webster, photographer, shot, who just recently passed away. And, uh, you know, the rest was history. Once you get a little music in your blood, you can't get rid of it. You know? Did you want to play music? When I was younger, I had a, I think it was a Magnum or Magnus keyboard, you know, a little chord thing and it was a an organ where it had you know little buttons on the left you push to play chords. oh i remember and, those yeah. yeah yeah you know and i remember when you know the doors came out i learned how to play light my fire the beginning which you know ray was great you know that's iconic sort of beginning to any song but you know i think everybody has a vision of wanting to be in a van, a band and, you know, have everybody go, ooh, on, ah, you know, get all the chicks and everything like that. But, you know, I gave that notion up early on in my life, so. <laughs> now, early on, are you spinning up to uh, the Whiskey or the London Fog or any of those clubs back then? I've never heard of London Fog before, but yeah, I used to go to the Whiskey. Yeah. We shot John Mayo, which there's a picture there, right around the wall there, and Lee Michaels, I remember seeing. And I, yeah, I used to go to the Whiskey probably, you know, don't forget. And so, uh, God, we're talking 70, 71. I mean, the first show I ever saw in my life was Cream. At the Santa Monica Civic, February 23rd, 1968. So that was way before I was shooting photos. You know, it was Steppenwolf, Electric Prunes, and Cream. And then, you know, I used to go to some other shows. And in November 69, I got a camera and brought it to the Stones at the Forum. Tickets were 450, 550, 650. You know, I was a little 
14 year old kid so i couldn't afford the six dollar and 50 cent seat so i had to buy the 450 seats and then you know those were in the nosebleed section so after you know a few minutes i'm like screw this i'm gonna go hang with mick and keith and i just walked to the front of the stage and uh, stood there the whole night and shot photos you know they didn't have the goonie bouncers back then like if you went to the forum they had the forum usherettes and ushers or santa monica civic had the ushers there was no security back then so you could pretty much do anything you wanted that's so wild just to walk right up and be taking pictures yeah it was great you know from, from right in the front row just standing there for the whole stones who were my idols back then you know and that was the first photos you shot pretty much i think i shot some at the Hollywood Bowl with this camera I had that was a rangefinder camera that I never really knew how to work. I think it was Blood, Sweat, and Tears headlining, and Johnny Winter was the opener. But I consider the Stones in November 69 the first show I ever shot. What camera was that? Like a Pentax or that something? That was a Pentax H3V, and then I had a Vivitar 135mm lens, which actually broke at that show. And what broke was... The focusing barrel. So when you normally, back then, there's no autofocus back then, you know. now Nowadays, the cameras aren't foolproof. The cameras are idiot-proof. Anybody walking down the street, anybody in this world can shoot a picture, a, a pretty good photo in this day and age. So, but back then, there was no autofocus, no auto exposure. There was no window on the back that you look at and go, duh, the picture's too light, let's make it darker. Duh, the picture's too dark, make it lighter. <laughs> you had to know your craft back then. It was film. And film was expensive to buy, and film was expensive to process. So there wasn't any room for errors, which like now, the photographers shoot 10,000 photos. Yeah. Three of them are good enough, and then they spend two weeks in Photoshop fixing in those three photos so yeah and they they fucking over blast them yeah and they, they do fit. that i mean yeah. you know we had our tricks of the trade back when i was shooting too to take a bad photo and make it look good like you could do a bar relief or a solar a solarization or a reticulation so those are little effects you could do in the processing or in the dark room to take a, a lousy shot and make it look good so what when you got home and looked at those photos were they good i thought they were back then i mean i still have some of them and you know what i thought was good back then i look at them now and go what was i on drugs or something because they don't look so good compared to what i later honed in my craft you know i mean you know no one's good in the beginning with anything whether you're a race car driver or you're a chef or whatever you of course do, you know when you're when you shot the stones and you got this camera, how are you learning stuff? Were you learning in school? Did they have a photography class? I talked to a lot of photographers and they're like, in school I took a class. Well, I had a class. I mean, my motto in life is if you want to do something bad enough and you want to do something good enough, you can learn it on your own. Like I had a lot of cars and motorcycles. I never went to auto shop or motorcycle shop. I learned how to work on them out of necessity and i like to think i'm a good chef so i didn't go to chef school to learn how to cook or anything like that same thing whether it's boning chicks you know you just practice makes perfect <laughs> you know so same thing with photography i at one point in my life whatever i do i try to give it five thousand percent I don't want to be, okay, this is good enough. So, you know, and there's so much. There wasn't a lot of competition back then in the photography world. And everybody now is a photographer. Yeah. yeah. Who was around when you, uh, like, that you were looking up to? Like Jim Marshall or what well, was Well, Jim on? Marshall, to me, is the greatest rock photographer that ever lived. Right. Okay, period. No one will come close to him. But he shot photos in a different day and age. Like now... Let's say you're Niels Lowe's hour, and I don't really shoot photos anymore. I don't have any desire to shoot photos anymore, yeah. okay? But now it's like, okay, Neil, we're going to let the Red Hot Chili Peppers come to your studio. You have from 12.03 p.m. to 12.59 p.m. to shoot them. So do whatever you can in that, you know, 53 minutes or whatever, and do it. 
Back in Jim's day, he'd go hang with Jimi Hendrix or Janis Joplin, whoever. He would live with them. He'd go to the morgue with them. He'd do drugs with them. You know, he'd live on their floor. And it was more of a photo documentary style back then. It wasn't really, let's bring lights and do whatever. And to me, it wasn't until a friend of mine, Barry Levine, came around who did a lot of the early iconic kiss shoots and runaway shoots and shoots with Abba and Queen where he started building sets and he actually took people and used their body and posed them with their arms and their legs so you didn't have like four idiots standing there like four jlubs with their shoulders up in the air and their hands down like duh what do you want me to do you know so <laughs> so Barry to me single-handedly changed the whole face of rock and roll photography so once you shoot the stones and you're looking at this you get that addiction and you're like oh i'm gonna start shooting photos well you know when i was in high school i always i always liked photography and, and the way it started was one day i think it was in 68 69 68 probably my aunt and uncle came down who were like the cool aunt and uncle and they lived in palo alto and i said to them oh what's cousin rick doing and they were like oh rick got a camera and he's shooting photos and i'm like you know 13 or 14 oh well, if cousin rick can buy a camera i'm gonna buy a camera too you know so i bought a camera and just started shooting, you know, I'd go to the, everywhere I went, I had the camera with me. Right. Now, you will never see me with the camera, period. <laughs> but, you know, I used to, like, walking down the Fairfax, which is a street where Canner's Deli is. Of course. I like shooting the old Hasidic Jewish people, because they fascinate me. And, you know, I used to shoot, you know, my cars or whatever, and you used to shoot friends, and you used to bring the camera to school and shoot photos. I mean, I loved it back then it was exciting and it was fresh and you know now it's all news after 49 years of course i get it if you do something forever it's like oh all yeah right. i mean i've talked to a lot of the great photographers and they all exactly have the same kind of frame of mind like ah i don't do that shit anymore yeah. you know it's well like, you, you know it's like like you said you get tired of the same thing and in this day and age like i said the cameras are idiot proof yeah and i wanted to go out on top I didn't want to be one of these guys that, okay, Neil, you have a photo pass for Taylor Swift and you got to shoot from the soundboard with a 500 millimeter lens. Yeah, fuck you that. You know, I grew up and still, when I, first of all, you'll never see me at a concert shooting photos. But for instance, today, early, I was at John Five's house doing a shoot with him. And Monday, I was at John Five's house. And then last Friday, I was with Slash doing him. So I still shoot photos but just not live photos. Right. Well, I want to have total control on what I'm doing and I want to be able to light it and I want to be able to go where I want to go and do what I want to go. I don't want someone to tell me you got three songs in the pit, but even the bands that I work with now, I mean, if I go shoot someone, I can always get the whole show. Of course. I just now, I sort of want to relive those moments I miss for the last 49 years being at a show and shooting photos. But, you know, I remember a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. I uh, always uh, I always talk about these dummies with their iPhones shooting the whole show, and they're not going to remember one thing where compared to I've been watching shows since 78, I remember everything for about 30 years. Right. And the last 10 years, I don't remember shit because I'm one of those idiots shooting some photos, yeah. you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, things have changed at, at rock shows and... You know, I mean, you had venues like the House of Blues, which I called the House of Rules. Yeah. And when you're a photographer, don't go here. Don't lean on the stage. You can't go here. You can't go upstairs. No, you can't go to the bathroom. You can't do this. Don't do that. It's like, you know, just, you know, when you get my age, you want to be treated like some little kid anymore. Yeah, you know? it's a burnout. Yeah. So you get up and running. You shot the stones. You get a little bit of the itch. And then... How does it start to really start happening for you? Are you just shooting? You going to the clubs? What's going well, on? Well, no. I mean, then I'd go see 10 years after. Then I went and saw The Who at Anaheim Stadium. Ooh. And then, uh, who else? Canned Heat and Eric, Derek and the Dominoes. And I'd always have a camera with me. And then I hooked up with this friend of mine, Todd Gray. And he had a... Uh, friend who used to make these phony backstage passes yeah i do that too from the cassette cover well no <laughs> we he would go to the art store and he'd buy little cards and he'd buy stick on letters yeah and he'd make this thing it said greg brown presents Derek and the domino santa monica civic this date and 
we'd go there and like i said they just had the ushers there yeah so we'd show this to the ushers and they're like oh yeah you can sit down in the aisle and just stay here the whole night we won't bother you just do whatever you want so that worked for a long time i mean we had tickets it just once we got in yeah, we went wanted, right to yeah. the front and did whatever so i got a lot of shots there and then you know, sometimes I snuck my camera, and I remember David Bowie never let photographers shoot him. So one day I had to sneak a camera into the form, and there's the shot back there of Bowie. That wow. I got. That's what from, year is that? I think that's 74 or 76. It was after the Ziggy Stardust period, which I never saw Bowie in that period of time but yeah i never really liked that period of time anyway i mean my favorite david bowie album is probably aladdin sane so right yeah i was just talking about bowie today i, I saw him so many times and i just love that uh you know serious moonlight tour the yeah. kind of the comeback let's dance and all that yeah i don't remember that tour i think the last time i saw david bowie was 83 you know yeah that was it 83 oh okay well yeah. that was at the forum yeah did yeah did you grow up here I grew up in the Bay Area, but okay. I saw him at the US Festival and at uh, Oakland at a day on the green. You grew up, you look like you could be a little bit of a punk rocker. Did you know Laws Rocket? I know Laws Rocket, yeah. Hey, good Metallica. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, City's Gonna Burn. Yeah. Laws Rocket, City's Gonna Burn. And Mike Coons. Mike Coons, the hockey freak. Yeah, and Willie just died. I, I know. Yeah. I know, man. Did you know Jeff Weller? Yeah, yeah, man. The manager? Yeah, absolutely. Good friend of mine. I knew everyone in the Bay Area. It was right. a small, tight scene, you That's know. Cool. Uh, and, and like I said, the, the day and the greens were really where I learned everything about music because you would go and it would be Cheap Trick, ACDC. Uh, Ted, Ted Nugent, Nugent Journey. Journey. Aerosmith. Yeah. I don't know. I was yep. up there. Yeah, Van yeah. Halen. Yeah, yeah. How does now? I don't want to jump too far ahead quick, but your Van Halen photos are absolutely the greatest photos of all time of this band. And, and yeah, I would probably agree with you. No, there's no there's at least no the arguing. David Lee Roth period, seventy eight oh, yeah. to eighty four. Well, there's I, no other period. Yeah, uh, as I mean, far as I'm concerned, yeah. there isn't. But let's let's get into this. So while you're shooting photos. Uh, I would go to concerts at the Cow Palace and the Oakland Coliseum and uh, Henry J. Kaiser, all these. And there was guys like you. They would shoot, and then they'd be in the parking lot selling these 11 by 16s, yeah. uh, black and whites that were amazing. I'd cover my room in them. You'd get them for like $10, right. they these big photos. Were you selling them, or what were you doing? No, well, I mean, actually, so the first shows I did... Let's go back. So when I was a kid, I was a Rolling Stones fanatic. And probably four blocks from here on the corner of Wilcox and Hollywood, there was a record shop called Lewin's Record Paradise. And they were the only place in town that sold import records. So the import records, like, for instance, you would go buy Jimi Hendrix, Are You Experienced Here? And it would have this picture on the front and this picture on the back and these songs. But the imports had different graphics on the front and back. Yep. And maybe they didn't have uh, a Purple Haze, but they had Red House instead. Yeah. I did that with ACDC. You get the Dirty Deeds. Yeah. They had the drawings on the covers, like all, all that. Yeah, yeah, I was obsessed with that. Yeah, I had a few ACDC uh, ones that were Yeah, remember the one TNT? Austria. It was the dog pissing on the amp. Yeah. Weird yeah. shit, right? Yeah, so the, the thing. But the imports were $7 at the time the regular releases were $3. But me being 11, 12, 13 years old, I didn't have enough money. Even $3 was a lot of money. But I did have 50 cents and a dollar to buy 8 by 10s and 5 by 7s of the Rolling Stones that they used to sell here. So they sold photographs there. And me and my friend, Kenny Kubernick, his brother's Harvey Kubernick, who you may have interviewed. I don't know if you've done Harvey or not. But anyway, me and Kenny, we'd take the bus. We'd get off at La Brea in Hollywood. We'd be going in and out of all the shops. And finally, we'd be like, we're getting closer. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. And then we'd get to Lewin's, and we'd be like little kids in the candy store. Yeah. And we yeah. couldn't buy the albums because we didn't have the money. But, oh, look at this shot of Mick. Oh, look at Brian Jones. Oh, look at Keith. Oh, I got to have this. And then we'd take them home and put them on our walls at home. Yeah. Like like fans yeah i mean that's how most photographers i know in the music industry started is fans yeah so you know then again so after i started shooting you know uh, what do you call it the who and zeppelin and stones and 10 years after 
and all the big bands, BB King back then. But my f- Kenny Kubernick suggested I go to Lewins and see if maybe they'd like to su- buy some of my photos. But the owner, he was this English asshole prick. Yeah. So I went up and had a meeting with him. And he was sort of a dick. And I was like, can I use bad language on this? Yo, fuck yeah, oh, okay. bad language. Okay. So I was like, fuck. <laughs> bad language, yeah. I love okay. you, dude. So, so I was like, fuck <laughs> this guy. Yeah. So right across from Fairfax High School was this little record shop called Aaron's. I know it. Okay. And they were on Melrose across. So I decided to go in there and I talked to Manny, Manny Aaron, and we cut a deal. So we sold my prints for a dollar each. I'd get 60 cents. Manny would get 40 cents. And at the end of the month, I basically had about $33 that for coming towards me. But I didn't take the money. I just bought albums with the money because I was a music, you know, freakazoid. Of course. So, so that mushroomed into that. And then my old junior high friend, Todd Gray, he contacted me because he, he got kicked out of my junior high because he was using a phony address. So he didn't go to Fairfax High School, but his neighbor went to Fairfax High School. And Craig told me, hey, Neil, Todd wants to go shoot photos with you. So I sold him my Honeywell Pentax. I bought a Nikon and we started going to shows together and we called her. So his name was Todd Gray. So we he went by GZ or Gray's Lowe's Hour and we built a portfolio. And then one day Todd took it to Capitol Records and the art director there, John Hornley, loved it. And he hired us that night to shoot Cannonball Adderley album cover for $500, which was a lot of money in 1971, 72. That's incredible. Yeah, and then they loved the photo. And, you know, we were like 17, 18. I was still living in my mother's house. You know? <laughs> so I had no rent. You know, my mother was feeding me. You know, basically, you more or less don't really like girls at that age. You don't have to worry about all that crap, you know. Yeah. And the, so, you know, I, my mother would buy me my clothes. So it was, you know, I was rolling in dough back then. And then we built the portfolio and started going to other record companies and magazines. And like I said, there weren't a lot of photographers. But getting back to that, you asked me who was around. So Jim Marshall was the greatest. Then there was a guy, Ed Karif. He did a lot of stuff like Steppenwolf and Three Dog Night and stuff. There was a friend of mine, Jeff Mayer, was around, who's still around in this day and age. He doesn't really shoot music anymore. But there weren't a lot of guys around, at least in the West Coast, doing it. Right. Sam Emerson, Tony Lowe was around, Emerson Lowe. But my friend James Fortune was doing it a few years later. But, you know, you had Baron Woolman up in San Francisco. Yeah, Baron's a friend of mine. He moved to New Mexico, but yep. there One weren't a favorites. lot of people. Now there's billions of rock yeah. photographers. Yeah. Bill- it's meaningless. You know? Yeah, yeah. So how once you're shooting some covers and stuff, you're starting to get a name. Is this how you get into the uh, Van Halen world? How does this happen? Well, Van Halen was 78. Right. Okay, I started in 69, but, you know, I was shooting Zeppelin in Black Oak, Arkansas, and... What yeah. were you doing that stuff? Were you getting getting it to the management and were they using it? Well, it's a good question. You know, basically when you're starting off, you do whatever you can do. I mean, you know, so we shot a Black Oak Arkansas album cover. I think High on the Hog, we actually went to a pig farm, me and Todd, and shot some pigs for the inner sleeve of the album. I mean, back then, don't forget, you had big LPs, and the graphics were way more important Smoke. than now when you get a little DVD. You can't even read the liner notes on the thing. They're so small. <laughs> yeah. So back then, you know, the album graphics, the photos or whatever, that was an important thing of selling your record. Now it basically has nothing to do with selling your record because they're so small, you know? Yeah. Well, you don't even see the album work uh, uh, on, on iTunes or anything yeah. at well, all on well, streaming. So yeah, I, I've never downloaded one song in my life. I yeah. don't even know how to do it. Yeah. So every CD that I have on my iTunes library, I actually have the physical CD. Yeah. So I've never downloaded a song in my life. You still have all your records? Yep. Awesome. Awesome. I'll yeah. never listen to them again. They're here. Yeah, they're here. Yeah. <laughs> they're here sitting here. Let's talk a little bit about Zeppelin. Uh, could be my favorite band of all time, 100%. And you saw them numerous times. Yep. Uh, uh, what do you think was the primo Zeppelin gig that you saw? Well, probably 75 was the best tour. 75? Yeah. Wow, over 72, huh? 
Well, I saw 70, 73, 75, and 77. I don't remember much 73. Yeah. And, you know, when you watch the 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 video, what's the one that they have? How the... Uh, all the, how the I mean, how the West is one is great. Yeah, yeah. And, and the funny thing is, you know, everything changes. Nothing stays the same. I learned that from my mentor, Buddha. But... You know, cars that I used to hate, now I love them. And, and things I used to hate, like, I never really liked. Zeppelin 1, to me, is the best Zeppelin album. Oh, yeah. Zeppelin 2 wasn't as good. Zeppelin 3, I hated when it came out. Zeppelin 4 was too commercial. You know, all the other ones, Houses of the Holy and all those ones, they were good. But Zeppelin 1, to me, is the best. But I remember I used to really not like Bring It On Home, which is the last song on Zeppelin 2, and now, one of my favorite Zeppelin songs is Bring It On Home, especially the live version on How the West Was Won. I mean, yeah. that's just brilliant. And the whole last side of How the West Was Won with the big, long jam. Incredible. Yeah, just great. But see, when I was a kid and I used to see Jimi Hendrix or Zeppelin, you wanted to see the hits. You didn't want to see them jamming. Okay? Yeah, yeah. You know, like, you know, <laughs> Jimi, Jimi Hendrix did this show. It was out here. It was called... Uh, uh, Devonshire Downs uh -huh. and he was the headliner the first night and I wasn't there I was there Sunday but I hear Friday night you know that Jimi Hendrix gets on and these people are, are yelling Foxy Lady Purple Haze you know all of you know for the first three four songs and you know Jimmy finally just I hear he just said to us he went Hey, fuck off, teeny weenies. And he left <laughs> and he left the stage after four or five songs. So so the promoter was all pissed off. Yeah. And he basically made Jimi Hendrix come back on Sunday the day I was there. And Jimmy did this big jam thing. So which was good. But I have a bootleg of Jimmy from one of the forum shows that I saw. And and I remember sort of when I saw this show, I thought it was good, but I wanted to see the songs I knew. And a lot of Jimmy Live was him just jamming and improvising. And I couldn't get that when I was younger. Yeah. But I get it now, you yeah. know, my old way. You know, like how many times do you think Alvin Lee wants to play I'm Going Home for 12, 13 minutes? He probably was so sick of playing that song after Woodstock. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. When you're shooting the concerts back then, would you just shoot, because film was expensive, a couple rolls and then just enjoy the rest of the concert? Would you yeah. shoot the first three songs? Would well, you go all the way to the concert? No, they didn't have that first three songs I get bullshit. That, but would, you, would you just be like, because I always like when they first come on, to me, it's like, all right, there's the band, wow. And yeah. then later on, once they heat up, you're like, okay, now they're loosening up. Yeah, yeah. you know what? When I started as a fan, you know, I mean, first of all, I didn't even shoot color for the first two years. I think I remember in 72 starting to shoot color, but 69, 70, 71, I don't even think I shot color. And I used to develop my own film, and then I started shooting color, and then I started developing my own color film in my mother's kitchen sink. Uh -huh. And that was a lot more involved than developing black and white, which is three steps, the color was more like eight, nine, ten steps. So it was more involved. But uh, no, I think I pretty much was more or less, you know, like that Who show from there. I probably shot two, three rolls of black and white film the whole show. But I try to make my shots count. You know, today there is no film and processing. So you yeah. put in a 32 or a 64 gigabyte memory yeah, card, you could shoot 20,000 yeah. photos. Yeah. And like I said, you know, how many are great? You know, you don't see all the crap garbage shit. You know, this guy, hey, look at this photo of whoever. It's like, yeah, it's a great photo, but you don't see the other 10,000 he shot to get the one good one. Yeah, know? yeah, absolutely. So would you shoot throughout the whole show? I mean, because I'm just I, trying to uh, figure yeah. out uh, how you were watching the concert also. Well, I'd sort of watch and shoot. And, you know, I mean, you don't have to keep the camera to your eye the whole time. Of course. But you got to be prepared for what's going to happen. I mean, yeah. at this show, like, here's a picture of Pete jumping. So obviously, if the camera was down here and I saw him jump, I couldn't pick it up in time to get him. But, yeah. You know. I would go multiple nights. Like, if Van Halen came in or ACDC, they played two, three nights. And then you would see pretty much what was going to go on. You're like, okay, this is where the fucking fire well, is going to be. Well, that's what you learn. I mean, when I was on tour with Van Halen or whoever, you learn when this guy's going to jump up and down and when the lead singer's going to bend over backwards or when they're going to 
do whatever they do. You you learn that, you know, you know, I was on tour with numerous bands from Ted Nugent to Aerosmith to Motley, Guns N' Roses, Van Halen, you know, you name it. I've been there, Bon Jovi. You know. Yeah. And, and how long when, when you'd go out with these bands, would they be one, two, three weeks, a long time? Nah, there's no purpose to really go out, you know, three weeks. I'd go out, you know, if they were going through Texas, I'd make a point to stay out as long as possible in Texas. I'm still trying to figure out how you get hooked up with Van Halen. Do you end up uh, meeting him somewhere in L.A.? Okay, so I met Van Halen. I was working in an office, and all of a sudden, Running With the Devil came on. I'm like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And then it broke right into You Really Got Me in Eruption. I'm like, I got to work with this band. And part of being a great photographer is being able to tell which bands are going to be huge. Yeah. Because you got to get these bands when they're nobodies. Once a band becomes big, all the parasite, maggot, leech photographers come out and want to work with you. So you got to work with them when no one else is working with them. So I heard this band, Van Halen. You were working in an office? What, what I was working in an office with three other photographers, Neil Preston, Andy Kent, and Barry Levine. They had a right. company. I worked for them yeah. at the time. That imploded after about a year because everybody had personality conflicts and stuff like that. So... So I heard Running With The Devil, you really got me an eruption. I'm like, I got to work with this band. So I found out who their management was. They're actually, me and Barry were hired to shoot the first Texas Jam in wow. 1978. Amazing. Yeah, I think Hart was there and yeah. Ted Nugent and uh, maybe Aerosmith, I can't remember. But Van Halen was early in the day. So... I'm at the Texas Jam, and we had clearance to shoot everybody. Yeah. And I'm on stage. It's about 110 degrees, and this little short guy comes up to me. What are you doing on stage? Well, my name's Neil, and me and Barry Levine, we're hired by the promoters, and we have clearance to shoot all the bands anywhere we want. Well, you may have clearance to shoot all the bands, but you don't have clearance to shoot Van Halen, so get the fuck off our stage. Wow, and, back and, then even. Yeah, and this guy was about five feet three, had like Peter Fonda, Easy Rider sunglasses, black leather coat, black leather pants, mace, handcuffs, black leather gloves. He was the most intimidating guy I've ever seen in my life. In the he, boiling hot sun, yeah, he's wearing even at five foot three inches. Yeah, and that turned out to be their tour manager, Noel Monk. Oh no, yeah, who, who later went on Wrote to management, yeah, which has my cover on the book. So. Yeah. So anyway, I'm like, well, I guess I'm not shooting Van Halen. Okay, let's go in the audience and see if this band can deliver the goods. So they were amazing. Just blew all the other bands off stage. No shit. So when I, and I knew they lived in Pasadena. So when I came back to L.A. after Texas Jam, I made a point to see who did their publicity. And it was a friend of mine, Bob Gibson, who I knew. He used to run the biggest publicity firm gibson stromberg in los angeles so i called him up and said bob i want to work with van halen okay neil let's set up a meeting so he set up a meeting and i met all the guys at bob's office and about a week or two later they were doing the last shows of the tour one in san diego one in long beach i went and shot the whole shows Later, and then they had a day on the green. Yes. Where they probably were on one, two, three in the afternoon. I went up to that and I did a little impromptu backstage photo shoot with the guys. I saw those photos. They're incredible. It's got the yellow and yeah, green. Yeah, the weird reggae-looking backdrop yeah. there. And, back, and then yeah. the, the side of the stage photos are mind-blowing. Yeah, yeah mind those, those are good. So yeah. Those so, are good. <laughs> yeah, so... So I, I went, and then we had a meeting after, and they saw what I did, and then the next thing I was in, you know, because no one ever shot them like that. They had all these amateurs shooting them, and, yeah. you know, I guess Dave didn't tell me back then. He told me a few years later, he goes, you know, as long as when we had that meeting at Bob Gibson's office, you know, we all played dumb, but we all knew who you were. We saw your photos in Cream and Circus and Shit Parader and all that stuff. You know? Shit Parader. Yeah. So... So at the same time, you're, you're start, uh, ground zero of Van Halen, but you are starting to get uh, photos into those mags. How is that happening? Just from you cold calling well, them or turning them in? I had photos in magazines before. I had photos in Circus and Hit Parader, and there was a magazine here called Rock. A guy, Jerry Garvin, ran that. And then uh, 
uh, I forgot what else. There was there was just I mean I was on the scene before right. getting photos published. Guitar Player magazine that was probably the Oling Guitar magazine, which is funny because I that's who I shot John Five for, and that's who I shot Slash for, and I did a Joe Perry, Brad Whitford shoot for him, and a Don Phil. So I'm that's probably the only client that I still shoot for is Guitar Player. Did you shoot that Eddie Van Halen in his first cover where he's got the snake guitar on Guitar Player? That was Guitar World. <laughs> guitar World. Did you yeah, shoot that? Yeah. I shot God, that. that fucking guitar, huh? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, one of the amazing things you did and what Baron did was you shot the guys, but you also shot the instruments, which with these guys, let's say your Randy Rhodes photo where he's on the couch and there's three sitting there and he's got, those are such iconic guitars. And then Eddie Van Halen's whole line of guitars. Uh, that was genius move because those things are just as important as the player. Right. Uh, 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 that's how iconic they are when you see right. those. Well, see, I used to work for a lot of Japanese rock magazines, and one was called Player Magazine in Japan, and they used to have me go out and shoot guitar collections. So if Judas Priest was playing the form, I'd go there at sound check and I'd have the, you know, Glenn and KK's guitar tech, you know, get all the guitars and we'd have a guitar stand, put one here, shoot it, next one, shoot it. So I did that with Eric Clapton and Scorpions and Iron Maiden and Van Halen and you name it. I did that with a lot, a lot of different bands, Rat, Motley, Guns N' Roses, so on and so forth. So your Van Halen book, I, uh, autographed i see that thing at uh at uh the rehearsal studio over there uh mates mates yeah. every time i go there i grab that thing it's <laughs> such a smoking book but to look at that era of van halen so you shot him from 78 to 84 were you starting to see the wheels fall off was there like all oh. of a sudden you uh, get neil out of here any of that well not with me <clears throat> the wheels didn't fall off right but just the band in general, there's a lot of tension. You know, you know, I've seen this with every band, whether it's Motley, Rat, Poison, Van Halen, Guns N' Roses. They all start off as the best of friends, okay? And they're living in a one-bedroom apartment, you know, five, six, seven people, sometimes roadies, and they got no money, so they're eating McDonald's and Jack in the Box, and they, you know, all are boning the same chick, and, you know, they're all the best friends. And then once they start making money, like, for instance, this guy goes and buys a car and he buys a Lexus. Well, this guy's got to outdo him, so he's got to buy a Mercedes. And then the other guy's got to outdo him, so he goes and buys a Ferrari or a Lambo or whatever. And then this guy's got a girlfriend. She's got a 38-inch chest. So he's got, got to buy his chick bigger tits, so she's got to get a 40. You know, and it just... Every it all falls apart, you know. No bands when they get big, whether it was Rat or Ma, they all start hating each other. You know, they just did. You know, they're they're almost a tighter knit family when they're all broke and they're writing songs and they're hungry and they have nothing and so on. You know? Well, that's when it's the real deal. Yeah, like Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction. I mean, to me, none of the other Guns N' Roses albums come close, you know. Well, that thing's a, a straight masterpiece. Oh, yeah, it's great. I mean, Use Your Illusion, to me, doesn't even come even remotely close to that, you know. You got. You also have an Eddie Van Halen book out, and yeah. you, and you shot you shot the back photos for Van Halen too, and not all of them. Not all. Of them. All the shots of Michael, Ed, are all mine. The shots of Alex with his drum kit and the sticks on fire are not mine. And the one back cover shot of Dave jumping in mid-air broke not, ankle yeah right. well he doesn't have the broke ankle yet right but he's got it after that yeah so i didn't do that shot a day but the inside shots with the nurses and dave with the broken ankle those are mine all the ones of michael are mine all the ones that ed are mine that's that is smoking yeah. and and also you like this stuff here the su the sunset sound stuff uh -huh. you were down at the studio were you hanging out listening to him track that stuff mm -hmm. you know what when the band that thing was a setup session right so you know i was probably there three four hours and we did that then we did some shots in the control room but when a band's in the re recording studio and it's you know, $500 an hour or whatever it is. They don't want any photographer around wasting their time. So yeah. I try to do what I need to do and then split. But, 
you know, I remember once I was at Dave's house and they used to rehearse in his basement and it was maybe from 15 feet from the front wall to the back, which isn't a lot to set up drums and everything. Yeah. And it was a long, narrow, skinny room. But I remember they started off, uh, the first song they did at that rehearsal was You're No Good. And, you know, Linda Ronstadt did it. Well, I'm not a big James Taylor, Linda Ronstadt, Elton John, Jackson Brown. That's not my cup of tea. You didn't like that era? No. That I'm, troubadour. I'm, uh, yeah, Cat Eagles. Stevens, uh, the, the Eagles. Ah, uh, you so, don't like the Eagles? Wow. So I'm a rock and roller. Deep Purple, Bon Scott, ACDC. Bon Scott. Cactus, Rory Gallagher. Oh, yeah. You know, whatever. Yeah, so they did this version of You're No Good. They start off. I sort of got it. It was amazing. I had tears in my eyes. It was so good. I remember that day right now like it was yesterday. Oh. It was so good watching. And they were just rehearsing. No one else was there. It was the four guys and me. You know, and I was just watching them. You shot them quite a bit around that uh, mansion. Uh, well, they did most of their photo shoots around Dave's house. As a matter of fact, even after Dave, the band you know came to an end and after the 1984 tour and i continue working with dave in 86 dave we used to do a lot of shoots at dave's house i mean yeah. it's a pretty humongous mansion you know that place is crazy right now was that his dad's place yeah, that he it gave a, it to him i don't think he gave it to him i don't know what happened exactly but that thing somehow, is insane yeah but that house need, needed a lot of work and stuff like that yeah. it wasn't just a pristine you know thing it, there was right it, it had its issues old rundown pasadena mansions yeah, they got yeah yeah that you know probably all the wires in the wall were cloth braided wires yeah. from the old days oh, yeah, of and, course you know you'd be you know, taking a shower and someone flushed the toilet, probably the <laughs> freeze. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it may look big and impressive, but you yeah. Know. Let's talk a little ACDC. Of course, Bon yeah. Scott being my favorite. I got him tattooed on my Love side bon, here. Bon Bon, you know. Yeah, you, I, I know you shot the Highway to Hell tour. Well, actually, it's funny because ACDC... I used to go on tour with a lot of bands, like Day on the Green and stuff. And ACDC would always be on the bill. Always. But I, I never used to go watch them. I'd be always hanging with the headliner in the dressing room. And then one day I was at a midnight special with Aerosmith, Cheap Trick, Ted Nugent, and ACDC. Oh, shit. And ACDC gets on stage, and they did Sin City. Well, Sin City, I never knew who sang that song. But it was one of my favorite songs. I mean, how could you not like Sin City? Yeah. So all of a sudden, the band gets up there, and they're all, I'm like, this is the fucking band that sings Sin City? You mean I've been on 50 tours, and ACDC's been on those 50 tours, and I never once bothered to go out and watch them? And I saw Angus with a little schoolboy outfit and spinning around. I was like, so, so I got to see him with Bon once at Long Beach. Oh, yeah. And, and that Highway was... Highway to Hell Tour. Yeah, oh, and that yeah. was the only time I ever saw him live with Bond. Oh, you know? man, and you shot photos. I only saw one on your website, but did you get a lot from that night? Not really. I, I don't know what... By then, I don't know if I... I remember going there, and a friend of mine met me, and I wanted to watch his show more, but I didn't shoot a lot, but I had this one great shot of Angus with Bond in the I background. I saw that. Yeah. saw that. that and I have cool. shots from the Midnight Special, too, but, yeah. you know... Midnight Special, would they just uh, set that up at a studio somewhere yeah, and then run it, them all? Where was that? Yeah, it was at NBC in Burbank. Oh. Yeah, because it was on Channel 4. So right. It was NBC. So. I, love, I know the exact one you're talking about. Yeah. And so they would have all the bands in one day and an oh, audience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ACDC would get up and play three or four songs, and an hour later on a different stage here would be Aerosmith, and on a stage here would be Ted Nugent and Cheap Trick. So. Same audience? If yeah, more or less, if they wanted to stay, I was there shooting it, so we stood. But you know, it was a long day. It could have been, you know, get there at eleven or twelve in the morning, and you know, we would shoot the sound checks. We didn't shoot the actual shows because they can't have photographers running around. Yeah, and, yeah, this camera. Yeah, so we would always have to shoot the sound check. We were never around for the actual shows. Out of all the bands, who did you uh, like? What was your who was your favorite, and who did you start to hang with? Like maybe off of uh, work. That's probably Van Halen. Van Halen. I mean, you know, Motley Crue in its day. You know, Nikki 
me, Nikki, and Robin Crosby, we were like the best of friends. So, oh, wow. You know, in 1984, we all went to, you know, Club Med down in Martinique together. I think Nikki wrote about that in the dirt or whatever. Yeah, but, yeah. But, you know, so I spent a lot of time with Six, and Robin Crosby was one of my best friends, all the rap guys, you know, and Joey Allen from Warrant, he's a good friend of mine, and... Right now, you know, a good friend of mine is this sly guitarist who's insane. His name's Eric Sardinas. I don't know if you know Eric, but he's incredible, this guy, you know. So, but uh, now in my old age, I don't really do much of anything. I mean, I don't, I, I'm here, I go home at 3 30, stop in the market every day, go home, take my dog to the dog park, hang out with the other old geezers like me, <laughs> go home, watch a movie, cook dinner. I'm in bed by nine o'clock. No I mean, shit. Yeah, I'm not necessarily sleeping, yeah, but I'm in bed to watch the nine o'clock news, but I'm usually sleeping by 10 o'clock. How do you make uh, income? Are you still uh, copyrights on the photos and, and putting well, them out all the time? Well, you know, I have a photo agency, Atlas Icons, uh -huh. A-T-L-A-S-I-C-O-N-S dot coms, where we license my photos and Baron Woolman's and Eddie Malouk and William Hames and Mark Canner, whose family owns Canner's yep. Deli, because he used to be... I had Mark on, yep. Yeah, he's got the earliest Guns N' Roses, Jack Lou, so... I do that, but the way I make most of my money now is going after the infringers who steal my photos. Oh, that's what Glenny Friedman told me. He just constantly has lawyers and they catch him putting them on shirts and, and all that no, bullshit. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, let's just say uh, whatever his level is, of mine's course. about 100 times more intense than his. Oh, I can imagine because uh, especially stuff happens like let's say the queen movie then the dirt film and, and all of a sudden people are constantly like oh let's grab photos and make money off it real quick well you know with digital photography and everything it's so easy to steal photos yeah so my stuff if i want to make money i just have to type in van halen motley grew guns and roses do a google image search and there's thousands of my photos being used illegally and we only go after the one people with money yeah. But, I mean, even right now, I probably have five active lawsuits going as we're doing this inter uh, this interview. No shit? Yeah. And, and and what what kind of companies are they? Are they using them for shirts or? No, it's mostly just internet stuff. This, I mean, look, all the people who do shirts like this, it's like, they're all bootleggers. They don't have any money. How are you going to sue him? You can't sue the bootleggers. They're yeah. professional thieves. We go after people basically that use them on their internet sites and they have money. You, my lawyer's pretty suave about that. I love the guy. And so, you know, you don't go after someone who's got one of your pictures on Facebook or Pinterest or yeah. Instagram. So all my iconic images are copyright, copyrighted with the United States Library of Congress slash the Copyright Office. That's where the big money comes in. Yeah. So you can't even you can't even sue someone in court until your photo's registered. But the big money comes in if the photo's registered first, then someone steals it. If someone steals it and then you register, you don't get the statutory damages. Oh shit. So you know, so you can't even go to court. Let's say I see a photo that Pete Townsend. Yeah. And someone uses it. If I want to go to court, I have to register that image first before I can even take this guy to court. But then the infringement already happened, so you don't get to go for the statutory damages. Uh, so you got to have them all registered way back and then right. start searching, oh, this guy's been using it for two years. I've had no, it registered it, for... Well, on the internet, you could, usually there's a date yeah. when the story was initiated gotcha so you just look at the date okay this is 2017 then i go look well that motley's photo was registered in 2013 four years before the 2000s so okay we're going and we're going for statutory damages wow wow now you have a do you have a documentary coming out I well it's actually out it's been out since december okay and where can people see that well, if you have Amazon Prime, it's now free. Originally, even if you had Amazon Prime, you either bought it or rented it. But it's on iTunes Store, 
Google Play, Amazon, Amazon Prime, or Vimeo On Demand. Oh, I got to watch that. Yeah, it's pretty entertaining, if I do say so myself. As a matter of fact, <laughs> Pussycat, the girl who just called me, she's in that documentary. Yeah, so. yeah. So. Now, we're sitting here in uh, a great location in Hollywood, and you've got a, a bunch of motorcycles, and I am a motorcycle freak. When did this come about? Uh, you know, I, I started collecting bikes in about 1990. And w what were you starting with? Were you riding? Uh... No, actually, the first bike I bought was a 68 Triumph Bonneville. And I actually bought it thinking it's a piece of art. I mean, to me, motorcycles, at least totally. the ones I like, are pieces of art. Not all motorcycles. but So my initial plan was to restore it because I was already into cars. I'm into cars, too. I got quite a few cars. But... What do you got? 54 type bentley 62 chrysler imperial 64 jag xke roadster 65 corvette stingray roadster Ooh. 1991 acura nsx oh sorry an nsx 2001 not 91 oh, 2000. my buddy ross robinson had that the producer yeah i think no i don't know wait do i know ross? yeah you probably know ross he did slipknot and all yeah. those all those bands well, i yeah. did the first I did the second and third Slipknot album cover. Right, so. right. As a matter of fact, Sean's in my documentary. So you got NSX. and How many cars you got? Well, five vintage. Yeah. I had six, but one of them was a 70 Roadrunner convertible. Oh, very yeah. rare. Yeah. That I gave to this piece of white trash that basically I gave it to him in 2011 to do a ground-up restoration. I still don't have the car back, but oh. that, that's what happens when you deal with drug addict trailer trash. So. I had a 69 Roadrunner convertible R1 Red. Okay, R1 that's cool. Red. 383? 383, yeah. uh, four on the floor, uh, black top, and then I traded it for a restored 70 Dodge Super B, B5 Blue. That's the best color, B5. B5 blue is beautiful. I know. Well, my, my Corvette's Nassau blue. The same thing, yeah. That close, not yeah. quite, but the B5 blue is my favorite best. color. Yeah. It is the best. Except one's a convertible, one's a hard top. But in my old day, in, in my old age, I don't really like the sun too much. I don't anymore. like it either. No, uh, and I don't like how. Uh, convertibles whistle and you, you, leak yeah, well, you get and more wind noise moldy. yeah and, and it's a muscle car it shouldn't be a convertible even though the mopar cuda convertible hemis are worth a fortune i'd much rather have a a hard top yeah, yeah i like the hard tops of my old age you know so what do you got bike wise here you got uh oh, i got too many to name yeah you got how many you got 23 23 bikes yeah, <laughs> yeah. and do you ride them Every single one. <laughs> Every single one. And, and and no, it's mostly Triumphs and Hondas and stuff, right? What do Triumphs, you Triumphs, Hondas, BSAs, Lavertas, Moto Guzzi's, Benelli's, Air Machis, BMW's, Royal Enfield, Shit. Aerials. Uh, Got any Lef Crockers? Nah. I, I don't like those, honestly. Really? They they remind me of Harleys, and I'm the only Harleys I like are Air Machi Harleys, if you know what those are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So wow. I, I'm not a Harley guy. I don't like Indians. I don't like Harleys. Uh, Crockers do nothing for me. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Z <laughs> zero. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. <laughs> you almost get angry on it. Fuck those things. Well, it just, <laughs> to me, it looks like a Harley. And yeah. I don't like Harleys. They're big, fat, loud, ill handling, obnoxious. And, you know, I go to the rock store on the weekends and I see most of the people who ride those bikes and I'm like, I don't want to be associated with that. Yeah, you know, I so. got gotcha. you. A lot of them are, uh, they don't even ride. Well, they, they, you know, they're weekend warriors. They're like doctors and lawyers. And then the weekend comes, they put on their big Harley coats. And, you yeah. know, that's, that's, yeah. I, my bikes to me are all pieces of art. And mechanically, you know, I do all my own work on my bikes and I maintain them and everything. And I enjoy that as much as riding. If something happened to me, and I could never ride again, I'd be fine just working on bikes. Yeah. Because you know? so, I like uh, enjoyment, sort of mental therapy. Are you a comedy guy at all? You like comedy? Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, I don't go to the comedy store or the improv. I, I live three blocks from the improv. Yeah. Never go there. You but, should go. Yeah. I think you dig it, man. I mean, I like watching Martin Lawrence. Yeah. 
And uh, what's the guy with Jackie Chan? I love him, the the black dude. Oh, Chris Tucker. Yeah, he's great. But he, he's only great with Jackie Chan. Those two are great together. Like, Jackie Chan, without Chris Tucker, I don't want to watch a Jackie Chan movie. Yeah. You know? But, <laughs> you know, he, but I like, you know, comedy. I mean, the first Eddie Murphy stand-up comedy. Delirious. Yeah, that one's out of control. One of the funniest things ever. And, you know, Richard Pryor was great. So Well, okay. I can't thank you enough for doing the show. And let's talk about you've got the, the you got the Eddie Van Halen book out. These are all available on your website, and these books are fucking masterpieces. You got five books. Right. Uh, the two that I've seen are the uh, the portraits one and the Van Halen. I haven't seen the Eddie Van Halen one. Right. I've saw well, the, there's Van Halen. Then yep. the next one was Motley Crue Visual oh. History. Then there was the Fuck You Rock and Roll Portraits. That's what I saw. Comp- compilation. Of, yeah, because I don't even have the Motley or Six String Heroes. I don't even have any of those anymore. They're all gone? Yeah, they're sort of hard to get. And then the Eddie Van Halen book. So, The Eddie Van Halen book. Boy, I, I haven't seen that yet, but uh, just your photos of, to be around at that time still to me is just... I can yeah. see... I talk to a lot of people where they're like, Hey, man, you're going to go see such and such? I'm like... I saw them 10 times from yeah. 78 to... Yeah, 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 and none of the bands now are, are the original member. Go see Foreigner and oh. maybe Mick plays guitar. Maybe. Maybe, but, maybe. You know, whoever it is. I mean, you know, I mean, Motley was Motley, but whatever. And Bon Jovi's not the original band. The Who's not the original band. Yeah. Heart's not there. It's no more Heart. I guess the sisters had a fight. No, they're back together now, fine, oh. which is great. Well, yeah. yeah, I guess they want to make money. You uh, know, so. Well, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's rock and roll. I always say it, you're not supposed to go past five years in a band, I think. Well, you that's know? really the longevity because if you look, whether... I mean, Poison, they came out in 86, five years would be 91, they were pretty much done by then. Yeah. You know, Motley, 83, five years, 88, they were still doing good, Motley. Guns N' Roses came out pretty much 86, 87, by 89, to me, they were pretty much done, you know. So it just, you know, band, you know, Van Halen, 78, 80 to 84, so that's six years, but... You know, the longevity of bands, you know, yeah. just... Yeah. The, uh, before we go, I wanted to talk about the Devo show, uh, shoot because I'm a huge Devo sh- freak, and you did, I believe it was a Moog ad, that one where they're all yeah, got the Moog yeah, keyboards. Yeah, it's up, I'll show you in the Yeah, other. that's like, I know that photo religiously. When yeah. I saw that you shot it, I was like, oh my God, I love that. Did you shoot Devo a lot back then and some punk rock? Because you did shoot Sid Vicious, I saw. Yeah, well, I went to the... Sex uh, Pistols. Sex Pistols shows up at Winterland. Oh, you went to the last show? Yeah, which was terrible, if you ask me. I mean, I wasn't a big punk rocker. And I went to the Erg show at the Santa Monica Civic, but... You know, that was Para Ubu and I think television and missing persons and the cramps and some of that. That wasn't my cup of tea. Yeah. You know, so. But, I mean, I shot Kenny Rogers. I shot the, the Commodore's live album cover. I used to shoot Dottie West, George Jones. Shot Elvis Costello, Blondie, you know, all those people. Did you shoot the Us Festival? Because I yeah, was there. Yeah, I was there. Did you shoot all three days? Yeah. Oh, Bowie was the third day. Yeah. Uh, Van Halen. I don't first... think we stood around for Bowie. That was the last. I'm like, listen, we were there for three days. I'm yeah. like, I told my friend I went with Jeff Mayer. The third day we woke up in the hotel room and he's like, come on, Neil, we got to get rolling. We got to get the, vig- the gig. I'm like, Jeff, I think I'm just going to hang here at the hotel and hang with girls by the pool. I don't <laughs> want to go back. I mean, to me, the middle day was the rock day. Yeah. With, you know. Yeah, Van uh, Halen, Scorpions, yeah, Judas Priest. Yeah, that Motley, was the day. The Quiet first Ride. day was a little weird. The Clash, though. Did you did you shoot the Clash that yeah, first I day? I shot the Clash. Well, you got some photos from that? Yeah, but they aren't very good, if you ask me. The stage was high, and yeah. I, I got some photos. Oh, but. that's it. That's the last gig with the original lineup. That, that is? That's it, yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. Then Mick Jones quits after that, and they yeah. go. They carry on a little longer, but if, you know, yeah, fizzles out. Someone died, I think. Bo- both the guys died died didn't he 
Uh, just one is dead, and that's uh, Joe Strummer. Oh, Mick Jones is still alive? Oh, yeah. Uh, I saw okay. uh, Jacob Dylan and I went and saw him last year, Big Audio Dynamite at the Roxy, and he fucking killed it. Yeah. We thought, yeah, let's go for a couple tunes, and we were jaw-dropping on that. Yeah, didn't do much. I mean, you know, London's Calling is a great song. But then they had some little bullshit sort of wimpy stuff, too, if you ask me. <laughs> you know, I like it like Deep Purple in their heyday. Yeah. Like oh, I said, yeah. did H- you shoot Cal Jam? Yeah. Wow. 74. But, you know, that was David Coverdale's first American show. Yeah, I had Coverdale on two weeks ago. Yeah, well, David's great. One of the best singers ever. And, I mean, you know, I mean, Burn and Stormbringer are amazing. Oh. And even Come and Taste the Band with Tommy Bowen's a great record, if you ask me. Right, right. You know, Ben White Snake. I mean, David's amazing talent. Oh, you know? man. I mean, that that had to be crazy to be at the... Because you you shot all the, the stuff that I was at. I didn't go to Cal Jam, but... At us festival down the greens and 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 all that you see how big rock was oh yeah now it's just a shell there yeah. is no more rock anymore there's yeah. no rock i mean yeah. one of my favorite bands now is a band called rival sons love them some well, of my I, best friends yeah f- f- you know feral uh, was it feral roots oh that's a incredible yeah, the, the new first record? song do your worst oh, oh that's fantastic the and, new record is insane yeah, and jay's probably i mean scott holiday oh. is probably my favorite guitar Guitarist out there right now. He's so tasty. And Jay uh, has probably got the best voice in rock and roll oh, right now. No one comes close to him. No if you ask one. Me. No one. Comes no close. one. Man, what a band. Yeah. We should go see him together. They're coming. I know. know. I called up Scott. I'm hoping he's going to get me into the show. Oh yeah. And if he doesn't, I may drive. 400 miles each way to go up to san francisco to go see him oh at the fillmore yeah yeah because they got their you know family they're sort of from long beach so they yeah. got so much family here yeah, fuck so that. scott says the the less the guest list may be a little tight i said look i'll go by myself i just because the last time i saw him they played at the observatory yeah and it was on their day off from the aussie shows and jay was sick yeah even when he was sick he sounded better than any other singer out there yeah i mean the guy's phenomenal oh i've been watching him since uh for i don't know six years seven years now had him on the show early on yeah Yeah, so i'm at the echoplex what a great band Yeah. if if you people out there listening to this want to see an amazing band rival sons incredible yeah, let me know if you go to the Fillmore. I'll go with you. Okay, well, I'm going to stay at this chick's house that I oh, I'll, I'll, used to, uh, whatever. Yeah, I don't care. I got many. Uh, that's where I'm from. Oh, yeah, so. you're from. Yeah, I can stay Do anywhere. you know a friend of mine, Josh Withers, photographer? No. You know Christy Nishiyama? No. Photographers? No. no. Oh, no. Well, Josh is a photographer. Right. And then there's a friend of mine, Jerome Brunette. I don't know if you know him. No. Another photographer, but... So I know a few people up there. So I'm not a big San Francisco guy myself. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're you're L.A. born and raised, man. Yeah, you got it. So. Uh, you got. It. You sound like my man Brody Stevens there. You got it. Yeah, well, good, good, great comedian. Long live uh, Brody Stevens. Passed away. Uh, Thanks for doing the show, dude. My pleasure. I can't thank you enough, man. Uh, no problem. Dean. Uh, I, I've looked at your photos all my life. They're incredible, and especially. My, one of my all-time favorites is that massive Eddie Van Halen that was in the uh, on Sunset at the what's the place that oh, sun- Mr. Music had? Yeah, it was in the window for years. Him airborne on the Fair Warning tour with the Star guitar. No, that was nineteen eighty. Oh, women, cha- women and children. Yeah, it was tour. women yeah. and children. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I went to that Oakland and uh, I see uh, I saw that photo so many times. I wanted. It. I was like, look at that. How do how do you do that process? It, it's like a screen. There's no process there. But I'm saying I'm saying the giant photo, how do oh. you get it that big? Well, I don't know if that one that you saw was on a canvas. Yeah, or, it oh, was. It, you could get any things printed on canvas. Yeah, it was. But cool. they don't look as good as a print. Oh no, okay. Yeah. I loved it. I love that's that's the primo Van Halen photo. Besides yeah. the day in the green, yeah. that's to me the one where you see the crowd. Those are good too because I was on Eddie's side, so you could see his pedals and yeah. everything. It was just yeah. I'm doing my whole living room uh, day in the green. Oh, that's the cool. whole thing. It's uh, like all photos of Dan the Green. Right. So I got to get one of those. Yeah, except certain times of the day were better to shoot. Yeah. Certain times you have the sun blazing on them, and then at night. It was just like being at an indoor show. Night sucks. Yeah. All right. Thanks, my man. All right. Sounds good, Dave. See you, buddy.